Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. It's Thursday. Tonight is Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. I'm happy about it. Um, thank you all for joining me. Just confirm you can hear me. Let me make sure you all can hear me. Um, hey, let's see who we have on here. Gigi. Hey, Gigi. Gigi was first. Gigi was on here before I started. Um, she's from Laporte, Texas. Tammy was also on here before I started. Hey, Tammy. Tammy's watching from Virginia. Latoya from New York. Um, Miss Kimmy and hey, Miss Kimmy and I saw you the other night um, joining with us for the CCMA practice. She's from uh, the, is that Hudo, Texas? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yannette is watching from Dallas. She's about to get in the training program, but she studied with some books. Awesome, Yannette. Thank you so much for joining. Um, let's see. Lizette is watching from the Bay Area. Uh, let's see, Miss McKimmy says, I'm taking a CCMA exam in the morning. Will it be benefit? Should have watched this video. Definitely. Um, 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 so, um, yes, it will because this is the administrative test, but the CCMA does have some administrative questions. So just know that watching this tonight, um, everything that you see tonight, you won't necessarily see on the CCMA, but you will see some of it because the CCMA is the clinical exam. So you'll see mostly clinical, but you will, you know, definitely see a few administrative questions on there. So it, it'll be beneficial. Um, um, Latoya says she just completed MA with Penn Foster. Congratulations. She's about to do her certification exam. Which certification, Latoya? Um, Haley. Hey, Haley. Um, from the Bay Area, Haley is a regular here. Lizette, she's graduate uh, preparing to take the CMA test in June. All right, Lizette. And Capricia's back. Hey, Capricia, she's watching from Indiana. So I just want to let you all know, those of you that are taking, um, I, I always say this and I always, I just want to keep reiterating just in case somebody maybe wasn't here before and didn't hear me. But if you all are taking the CMA or the RMA and you're tuning into these videos, that's great. You know, um, but just make sure you're still, um, you know, studying that material. So make sure you're still studying the AA, the AAMA material for that CMA. And then also you're studying um, the RMA uh, uh, information as well, because even though the material, um, it'll pretty much, you know, be the same kind of stuff. But I just want you to make sure you're utilizing those study materials as well. I have had students that tell me they passed the CMA and RMA watching my videos, which is great. You know, but I just wanted to make sure I put it out there that I want you all to, to still be, you know, utilizing that study material. Um, okay, Latoya, she's taking a CMAA. Okay, perfect. So, yep, this is exactly what we're going over tonight. Um, Miss Sassy says she's watching from Cali, thinking about getting her CCMA certificate, still checking if it's okay. That's good. You got time to think about it, Miss Sassy. That's good that you want to, um, you know, you want to make sure this is what you really want to do. Definitely make sure because, you know, um, when you're working in the medical field, you're going to be working with people. You want to make sure you really love what you're doing. Shalandra. So Shalandra, she is a regular. Shalandra's on every video. Shalandra, um, and she's already working. Shalandra, um, you're going to have to come on here. And I, I've been putting it out there that I want to do some interviews, but you on here every time. You you, you got to come um, from behind that um, screen and come on here so we can have some conversations um, for the people because you're you're already working in the field. Hey, Aaron. Um, Aaron says he's taking it on Tuesday. All right. Which test are you taking on Tuesday, Aaron? All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Let me go over here. Um, <clears throat> oh, OK. Uh, patient care tech, EKG and CPT. OK, so you're doing uh, patient care tech, EKG. OK, got you. OK, I, Aaron, I just want to make sure you are studying those. You do have study material for those. Um, subjects, right? Um, it, I'm guessing you're taking all of those through NHA. The good thing about NHA, they have study packets for all of that. So hopefully you're reading it. Yeah, EKG is definitely harder. Um, Shalandra said, okay, that's cool. Make sure you email me, um, Shalandra. And for those of you that don't have my email, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat real quick. Um, if you all have questions, you can always email me. I'm going to start um, answering these questions on the video because I get so many emails. It's hard to type back. So I'm going to start um, doing videos to answer some of these questions. Um, oh, thank you, Aaron. He says your videos are amazing. And yes, I'm going to do NHA. Okay. 
Good. Okay. Just make sure you're studying. All righty. So let's get started. So you all already know, before we start, I'd like to shout out people that have um, let me know they passed. We have Evelyn. Um, she passed a few days ago. Emily passed. Marshall, um, Brittany, um, and Taylor. So congratulations to all of you all that have passed. Make sure you all are, you know, letting me know, commenting on the videos, letting me know that you passed if you want to be shouted out, okay? All right, so a few tips. Um, as always, let your life revolve around your study materials leading up to your test. Join medical assistant Facebook groups. Pay close attention to wrong answers on the practice test. And, you know, you'll see why as we're going through the practice test. Don't focus more on the questions than you do on actual content. When you guys go take this test, don't think you're going to see the practice test questions. Make sure you know what these things mean and not just looking for the exact question because you're going to be, you know, you're 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 going to be um, surprised in a bad way if you're looking for the exact questions. Create flashcards and have a family member or friend quiz you. Pay close attention to each question. Recognize keywords in that question. You'll see why as we're going through the practice test. Use process of elimination and then answer easy questions first. Flag difficult questions to come back to later. All right. And let me move this cursor out the way. You can screenshot that if you need to. Screenshot these tips if you need to. All right. Let me see before we get started. Okay. Yannette says, thanks for the videos. And um, you, oh, no problem, Yannette. And Lizette says, congratulations to everybody that passed. All right, let's get started. Which of the following is used to enter, edit, format, and print letter documents? Spreadsheet program, word processing, graphics application, or database program? Okay, I'm seeing mostly B. All right, seeing mostly B. Okay. All right, so let's see. Yep, yeah, that is correct. So it's going to be the word processing program. And so one thing I want to say while we're on this, this is exactly what I meant when I said pay attention to wrong answers. So if you see anything as an option on these tests, on these practice tests, that's because you're probably going to see it on the test. So when you see on your practice test that, okay, neither of those other answers were correct, but I need to know what those are. So spreadsheet program, that's Microsoft Excel. Be able to recognize that when you see it. And the thing about it is the test is going to, is going to mix these questions up. So spreadsheet program, that's Microsoft Excel. Or the question may even word it differently, and it say it may say which type of program is Microsoft Excel. You have to know it's a spreadsheet, right? Graphics application software, that's going to be Adobe Photoshop, okay? So you might see the question that says, what is Adobe Photoshop? It's graphics application software, right? And then um, database management, that's going to be the um, Microsoft Access. Let me try to, I'm trying to move this cursor out the way. So um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, database program, that's going to be Microsoft Access. The question may say, what kind of program is Microsoft Access? You, you're going to have to know that it's the database program. So make sure you know what each of these mean. So in each practice test question, know what each of the options mean because there's something that's something um, that you're going to see on a test, okay? Um, another one is Microsoft Outlook. That is for email and um, what an uh, email and um, the calendar, right? So you got to know what those different programs are. All right. When creating a new file for a patient named Jane, I'm sorry, Jane Johnson George, which of the following rules should you be using? Use only George, only Johnson as one name and keep the hyphen or one name and ignore the hyphen. So you're creating a new file for a patient named Jane Johnson George.
All right, I'm saying C and D. It looks like you guys already ruled out A and B. Hey, Brittany, I sh I shouted you out in the beginning. I don't know if you if you caught it. Congratulations on passing your test. All right, let's see. All right, so if you chose D, that is correct. Let's talk about this for a second. So A and B, we already know we can rule out because we know we can't just file the patient with just their um, last name, right? Um, right. So the reason why it's D is because when you have a hyphenated name, um, you want to ignore the hyphen and act like it's not even there. You treat it as one name, okay? So the rule is when you have a hyphenated last name, that means that a person has two last names, right? Most likely the woman is married, so she has two last names. When it's hyphenated, you're going to ignore the hyphen and just treat it as one name. I know this was a tricky one, right? Um, but um, just make sure you understand that. Ignore the hyphen. So instead of it being filed under Johnson, I'm sorry, under George, you're going to file it under Johnson, okay? So that George, when you go to, if you're doing... Um, if you have to put um, um, names in alphabetical order and they're hyphenated, you're always just going to go by that first um, last name, right? So G's, we're not even going to be looking at the G's because George, um, because Johnson and George is one name, okay? So whenever it's hyphenated, this is one whole name and ignore the hyphen. If this, let's talk about when it's not hyphenated, just really quickly. If it's not hyphenated, then you're going to treat it just what it looks like. If it's not hyphenated, it looks like a middle name, right? So you're going to treat it like a middle name. So if this wasn't hyphenated, then um, it would we would file it George, comma, Jane. And then the middle name always goes at the end, right? So you all know when you're filing pa patients' names, you're always going to file last name first, okay? So hyphenated, it will be Johnson, George, comma, Jane unhyphenated it will be george comma jane and then johnson will go on the, on on the end after jane okay all right let's see which of the following is an appropriate use of modified wave scheduling for one provider with 20 minute appointments i'm going to let i'm not even going to read these out i want you all to look at these um, it, I want you all to really look at these and think about it. I'll give you all a few. I'll give you all a little longer for this one, but it's modified way. Which of the following is correct for one provider with twenty-minute appointments? Look at them carefully. Okay, looks like everybody's pretty much saying A. All right, let's see. All right, that's correct. That is correct. So modified wave. Let's just talk about this scheduling. Uh, well, let's 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 look at this first, and then I'll just kind of quickly just kind of talk about scheduling. So, um, two. The reason why we can automatically rule out. Um, um, B, right? Let's look at this. Scheduling two patients at nine o'clock and two patients at 930. There is no way to, to fit four patients with, within 60 minutes, right? So one hour, we can't, that, that doctor wouldn't be able to see four patients within an hour if the appointments are each 20 minutes long, right? So we can rule that one out. And then also it says 20 minute appointments, so we kind of rule out 930. If it said 30 minute appointments, okay, then maybe we would look at that, right? And then here, this is three patients at nine o'clock, one patient at 930. Again, that's four patients. That's too many within one hour for that doctor to be able to see, right? Um, and also, like I mentioned, 930, if it was 30 minute appointments, maybe we could look at that. And then look at D, three patients at nine and three patients at 940. That's six patients within an hour. That's way too many if the appointments are 20-minute appointments. So that's why we can rule those out. 
Now, let's talk about wave scheduling and modified wave. So wave scheduling, we talked about that in a previous video. We know that wave scheduling is when several patients will be scheduled at the top of the hour, and then the rest of the hour is left open. And that hour is left open for the doctor to see all those patients, you know, and things like anything else he or she has to do. Um, with modified wave, it's a little bit different. With modified wave, he or she will have the two patients scheduled at the top of the hour, but then they'll also have another patient scheduled um, maybe at the second half of the hour or at 920 in this case, because this is 20 minute appointments. So wave is when all of the patients are scheduled at the top of the hour and the rest of the hour is left open. The modification to that, which is called modified wave, is instead of all three patients being scheduled at the top of the hour, two will be scheduled and then another one will be scheduled um, later in the hour. OK. Oh, Dana says she has her test tomorrow. She's so nervous. Understandable, Dana. We know we know you nervous. Miss Miss Kimmy said you got this. Which test are you taking, um, Dana? Hey, Q. I shouted you out on the last video. I hope you saw it. All right, let's see. Let's go to the next one. Which of the following describes a mother's condition who is receiving care after the birth of her newborn? She's receiving care after the birth. Is it intranatal, perinatal, antepartum, or postpartum? Okay, Dana's taking a CCMA. Dana, make sure you check out those CCMA videos if you haven't already and make sure you're studying. Okay, she's mostly having trouble with anatomy and physiology. Okay, I'm glad that you know that, Dana. So make sure if you have access to the study guide tonight and in, in early in the morning before you take your test tomorrow, go over that information. Like just, you know, even if you got to go through that whole um, section of the study guide, just Go over those areas where you know you're really struggling. And hopefully you won't see a lot of that information on your test tomorrow. I hope you don't. Um, and it's hard to say because each test is always is always different. So it's, it's really hard to say. All right. So I see mostly D's. Hold on one moment. I got to um, hold on one second. All right, let's see. All righty, so everybody chose D, that's correct, postpartum. Okay, this is um, what I mean by paying attention to key words. So it says receiving care after the birth of the newborn, right? Um, intranatal is when the baby is still um, with, within, um, well, actually that's um, during birth, that's within birth because natal refers to birth, right? Um, perinatal is the time around the birth, right? Um, antepartum is before delivery and then postpartum is after delivery. So this is a good terminology lesson to make sure you understand what intra means, peri, anti, and post. Good job. Good job. Um, Miss Kimmy says, I take my CCMA exam in the morning. Oh, you see? Yeah, she did say she's taking hers in the morning too. Yes, ladies, I hope you all pass. Let me know as soon as you take it tomorrow. All right. How is the primary insurance for a child determined when a child is, is insured by both parents? Is the primary insurance the um, will be the insurance carrier of the parent whose birthday comes first in the calendar year? The primary insurance will be the insurance carrier that provides more coverage. The primary insurance will be the insurance carrier that has a lower deductible or the primary insurance will be the insurance carrier of the parent whose name is alphabetically first. So both parents have insurance that covers the child, which determines um, which determ which of the following determines um, the primary insurance for the child. I'm seeing A so far. All right, let's see. All right, yes, um, it is determined by uh, the birthday. So let's talk about that just for one second. So the birthday rule, the birthday rule says that um, if both parents are are um, if both parents cover a child, right? 
um, and assuming that these parents are married. If the parents are married and they both have insurance on the child, the parent whose birthday comes first in a calendar year. So it doesn't matter who is oldest, right? So even if dad is born, let's just say January 1st, um, 19, well, let's say December 1st, 1970, and mom is born um, April 1st, 1980. Just because dad is older doesn't mean anything. It goes by who it's, who's ever birthday month is first, okay? So just make sure you understand that. Now, if the parents are not married, how is the primary insurance um, um, decided? The primary insurance is who's ever insurance um, went into effect first. Okay. So when, or if the court decides that, okay, dad's insurance is going to be primary and then, then, then that's an exception. But for them, but other than that, if the parents are not married, the insurance is going, the, the, the child's insurance is going to be, um, I'm sorry. I said that wrong guys. Forgive me. It's not, it's almost nine 30. It's, I'm, it's late. I said that wrong. I'm sorry. If they're not married, the primary insurance is going to but is going to be the parent who's the custodian parent. I'm sorry. The the parent who has full custody of the child, if they're not married, that is the primary insurance. Okay. That is the primary insurance, unless the judge decides otherwise. Okay. So let's say mom has full custody, but the judge decides that dad is gonna um be primary, then you know that is so. Now, when I mention whose insurance coverage is was effective first, that's in the case if both parents' birthday is on the same day, okay? So, sorry about that. I said that wrong. But if parents are married, it's whoever's birthday is first in a calendar year. If they're not married, it's whoever's um, the custodial parent. Um, if the parent's birthday happens to be on the same day, then um, the parents who had the insurance first will be the primary, okay? So hopefully I didn't confuse you all too much. All right, let's go to the next one. When providing preoperative instructions to a patient prior to surgery, which of the following techniques should the assistant use to decrease the patient anxiety? Mention another patient who had a successful surgery, call a patient the day before the procedure, review the written instructions with the patient or discuss alternative procedures. All right, I'm seeing mostly C. All right, let's see. Yep, that's correct. Review the instructions with the patient. D, we already know that's out because we can't do that. That's the provider's job to discuss alternative procedures. Mentioning another patient is not, you know, necessarily going to decrease the patient's anxiety because just because another patient had a successful surgery doesn't mean that he or she will. Call the patient the day before. Yeah, we're going to call her the day before to remind her, you know, but that's not to decrease her anxiety. So, yes, the answer is going to be C. Review the written instructions with her. Which of the following is included with the check when an insurance company sends payment to the provider? An ABN, coordination of benefits, agent account report, or remittance advice? I'm saying look for mixed answers here. I see C, I see D, B, I see A. Saying some mixed answers here. All right, let's see. All right, so you check. Oh, I'm sorry, I went back. 
All right. If you chose D, the answer is correct. Remittance advice. So let's talk about that. What is remittance advice? Remittance advice is the form, is the notice that they send to the provider's office. It's an explanation of benefits that goes to the provider's office. And it lets the provider know, you know, what was covered, if anything was denied. It pretty much shows the details of the claim. Okay. And it and key in this question with the check when the insurance company sends payment to the provider. So when they send that check, they're also going to send details of the claim and show, you know, what was denied or what was, you know, everything that was covered. OK, in that claim. Let's talk about these other options. Again, if it's here, you got to know it, obviously. Advanced beneficiary notice. That's the form that Medicare patients have to sign to acknowledge that Medicare may or may not pay for this procedure, right? That means that either the procedure is not on Medicare's fee schedule or for, for whatever reason, the provider gets a notice or some type of alert that this um, procedure or service is not covered by Medicare, okay? So when you see ABN, think Medicare. Coordination of benefits, that's when you have to determine which insurance is primary or secondary, right? Or if a patient has three insurances, which one is uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary? So we know it's not the coordination of benefits because that that's not something that the insurance company sends to the provider. That's something that we do as medical office assistants. Um, agent account report, that's a report of all the um, patient accounts that owe us money, right? So if the insurance company has not paid, that's a report of everybody whose insurance company we need to call or patients we need to call, right? All right. Fee schedules are based on which of the following? ASA, CMS, RBRVS, or AMA? I hope when we're going through these questions, I hope that you all um, are um, making note of things like as we're going through these, I hope that you all, you know, as you recognize things that you didn't know, I hope you all are taking notes when you're going through these questions um like for an example this right here this question here these abbreviations this would be a good time to make sure you know once we go over the correct answer if you didn't know these abbreviations when i give them to you that's the perfect time to write those down okay so um that's one of the ways i always tell my students to study you know when we're going through these together take notes especially for stuff you didn't know all right I see A, I'm saying C. All right, let's see. That is correct. So RBRVS, what is RBRVS? That's the resource-based relative value scale, right? That is what um, they use to determine um, how much they can charge for certain services and fees, right? Remember, we talked about that in one of the videos. We talked about how the things they look at to determine fees, right? They look at the geographical area where we are, right? I'm in DC, cost of living here is much higher than it is down in, let's say, South Carolina. So the fees are not going to be the same. They look at that. They look at what other providers are charging in that same specialty, in that same area. They look at um, what goes into that procedure or service. Those are things that they use to determine um, um um, the fees, right? So that's the resource-based relative value scale. What's ASA? Now, ASA can mean a couple different things. I think I mentioned, I know I told my students this, but I don't remember if I mentioned it here. Different, abbre um, abbre uh, different abbreviations, well, actually, um, you'll see the same abbreviations mean kind of different things depending on the context that is used in. For an example, ASA in this case is referring to Anesthesia Society of America, OK, because this is administrative. But if you were to see ASA in a patient's chart, that will refer to aspirin. OK, so just recognize that sometimes these acronyms mean something. And I said abbreviation, I meant acronym. Just recognize that some of these acronyms, they mean something different in different contexts. OK, CMS is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So if you didn't know that, make sure you write that down. And then AMA is American Medical Association. OK. Make sure you write that down if you didn't know that. 
Um, so um, I just explained that the RB, RBS, that is the scale that they use to determine fees, how, how much that they're going to charge um, for a certain service or fee. They look at the, the um, geographical area. They look at the provider, like what other providers in that same specialty charge. They look at even like they even look at what they have to pay for equipment, materials, what they have to pay their staff. Those are things that goes into the RBRBS. Oh, and did you want me to say the brief what it means, what the uh, what it stands for again? So it's the resource based relative value scale. Resource based relative value scale. I hope that helped, GD. All right. The MOA should recognize which of the following as a misspelled word, procedure, preceded, psychiatry, or persistent. Okay, she, um, Yonessa says, what's the difference between usual, um, customary, and reasonable? That's a really good question. So usual is, um, what do they usually charge? Okay, what's usually charged for this? So you know, if they're, I, I just, I'm just going to use echocardiogram as an example. Let's say they're trying to determine a fee. They want to say, okay, so what's you, what are, what are echocardiograms usually, um, uh, what do they usually charge for, um, for, um, for, uh, for echocardiograms, right? So customary, so customary and usual are kind of the same thing. What is the custom? What do, what is normally, and, um, and honestly, really usual and customary is very, very similar because they're looking at, what other um what other um providers are charging and then reasonable is what is a fair price so reasonable meaning okay can we really charge five hundred dollars in this area like here in dc i know in my old office we did charge five hundred dollars for an echocardiogram or what well one it was different kind of echocardiograms but one of them was five hundred dollars and they will look at okay is that reasonable to charge five hundred dollars okay maybe we're in South Carolina or we're in, you know, maybe, I don't know, um, Atlanta, for an example. Um, um, is it reasonable to charge that here? You know, so that's reasonable. Like, is it fair? OK, so again, usual and customary is kind of the same thing. They look at what do they usually charge? Customary is like, OK, what is the custom? Right. What, what do they usually charge? They look at um, um, how much the provider will have to invest in equipment how much they have to, um, how much of their education went into the service, you know, that they're providing. This is why they're paid more. This is why the, the more credentials that providers have, the more they're paid because their education, the cost of their education actually goes in to what they can charge. So I hope that makes sense, Yannette. All right, so seeing mostly these, yes, yeah, so looks like everybody's mostly choosing B. Yes, persistent. That should be T E N T. T E N T. Everything else is spelled correctly. All right. Um, the MOA should retrieve which of the following when submitting claims to third party payers a day sheet, appointment list, and counter form or patient ledger. Third party payers just means insurance company. So which one do you need? You need to submit a claim to the insurance company. Do you need a day sheet, appointment list, and counter form or patient ledger? Which of those are going to help you fill out that claim form to send to the insurance company? All right, I'm seeing mostly C's popping up. Yes, that's correct. Y'all, y'all are y'all are on it. Yes, and counter forms. Let's talk about these. Okay. Day sheet. What is day sheet? Day sheet shows the transactions for the day, right? So um payments you're receiving, payments you're making, right? That's what the day sheet shows, whether it's cash or credit or check, right? We're, we're making a note of all the financials for that day, right? That's the day sheet. That's not something that needs to go along to an insurance company. Appointment list, that one we can already kind of rule out because appointment list is, of course, a list of our appointments for the day. And then patient ledger, 
patient ledger is specific to one patient and that is from a historic standpoint so that's the patient's ledger of all their all their um payments um um since they've been a patient there and that's kept inside the patient chart so that's not something that needs to go along with the claim right but the encounter form does because the encounter form is what the doctor you know that's where it would, the provider he he or she will um indicate the diagnosis code the cpt code um and then we'll make a we'll make copies of that if it's not a carbon copy we'll send a copy off with the patient we'll keep a copy and then we'll send a copy with the insurance company all right which part of medicare offers prescription benefits a b medicare advantage or c or part d prescription benefits a b c or d Okay, let's see, let's see, and see. All right, let's see. All righty, part D. So let's look at this. So Medicare A, B, C, and D, you definitely need to know these parts. A is inpatient, B is outpatient. Medicare Advantage is part C. That's a combination of both inpatient and outpatient. And then D is prescriptions. Think of D for drugs, okay? So A is in, B is out, C is both, right? Or Medicare Advantage. And then D is drugs for prescriptions, okay? Which action should you take when speaking to a patient who has difficulty hearing? Move the patient to a quiet location. Ask the patient to turn her hearing aid up. Sit side by side with the patient while you're speaking or speak in a loud voice. All right, I'm seeing mostly A's. Let's see. All right, y'all are on it. Move the patient to a quiet location. All right. Um, we definitely not going to sit side by side with the patient. If anything, you want to be in front of the patient. Okay. So if you happen to see a question and it's asking you, you know, what's the best way? And, and one of the options is, you know, um, allow the patient to see to, to see you because you want them to be able to read your lips, okay. Ask the patient to turn her hearing aid up. That's kind of rude. Um, and then speak in a loud voice. You'll see that. Speak in a loud voice or yell. That's that's going to be the incorrect answer. Even though, you know, you may have to raise your voice a little bit to help them hear you. But uh, for test purposes, speaking in a loud voice is always going to be wrong. Speaking in a loud voice. And then sometimes I see on here, it'll say actually yell. And we already know that's not that's going to be incorrect. But move the patient to a quiet location is going, is going to be the correct answer. All right, which of the following needs to be signed before releasing a patient's PHI? Approval from the provider, implied consent, a signed release of information from the patient, or a sign of notice of privacy practices? And what's PHI? Protected health information. So before you release the patient's protected health information, some people, they end up saying patient health information. That's not it. It's protected health information. It's PHI. Which of the following do you need? This is going to be another example of making sure you know the, the meanings of each of these wrong answers, too. Another prime example. All right, I'm seeing C. I saw one D, but mostly C. All right, let's see. Oops, I went back. 
All righty. C is the correct answer. C. Let's talk about this for one second. So A, we can automatically, um, you know, rule that out. Approval from the provider. We know that that's not that's not an authorization to release patient information, right? But let's talk about B and D because you have to know those things. So implied consent. What is implied consent? For first of all, implied consent is never going to be signed. That's anytime you see implied consent, that means that we are um, assuming that the patient has given us permission based on their actions. Okay. So implied consent is not signing anything. It's not expressing anything. It's based on their actions. When you imply something, that means to suggest something, right? So make sure you all understand what implied consent is because you will, you, you may see that on the test. That's definitely something you'll see on the test. Notice of privacy practices. You'll definitely see that on the test as well. What's the notice of privacy practices? That's the form we give that um, to the patient um, to, to let them know how their information will be used. It lets them know that their information is private, except when we are, you know, um, sending their information to the insurance company to get paid, right? If we got it, if we need authorization, prior authorization, we got to send their progress notes, maybe. You know, if um, there are certain um, things that we don't need their permission to send you know, um, their information. So that's the notice of privacy practices. So make sure you know what that means too. Or NPP, you may see NPP. Cassandra. Hey, Cassandra. So you, you made it. Cassandra, it looks like you are a little bit behind. You may need to, um, I know when you join live, let me go back for a second. I know when you join live, um, some you have you may have to move the cursor um you may have to move um you may have to fast forward the video cassandra so that way you're you're um you're with us i see you it's i see you on a psychiatrist question so it looks like you are a little bit behind all right which of the following contains information on hazardous substances eomb CDC, ABN, SDS. Here's another question with acronyms in them that you're going to need to know. And I just realized I'm talking to Cassandra and she is um, behind. She's not going to. Let me um, type something in the chat to Cassandra. Hold on one second. Okay, looks like everybody's saying D. All right, let's see. Yeah, you're correct. It is D. So let's talk about these acronyms. Um, so EOMB, what is that? That's the explanation of Medicare benefits. That's the explanation of Medicare benefits. So we talked about explanation of benefits in a previous video. What is explanation of benefits? So it goes to the patient um, to let the patient know. It shows the details of the charges for that visit, right? So it'll show what was covered. If anything was denied, it'll do that. It'll show how much of the deductible was applied to the visit. So that's the explanation of benefits. The EOMB is explanation of Medicare benefits. CDC, Centers for Disease Control. Now, ABN, everybody should have been able to rule that out because we just saw that. Um, so make sure... You know, you're paying attention to um, information that was in previous questions that, that that we already went over. Make sure you pay attention to those so that way you can rule that out. Because remember, you know, one of the things you want to be doing with these questions, you want to be using process of elimination a lot. OK, so um, you will have a lot of you will have some questions where you have to use process of elimination and say, you know what? I know that's not it. So I can rule that out. Um, and the SDS is the safety data sheet. Okay. Um, that is the safety data sheet is um, about hazardous. Um, it shows, it tells us hazardous, um, like where to store them, how to dispose of them, safety data sheet, or you may see MSDS, material safety data sheet. All right. 
Um, when should you remind a patient of their appointment that's scheduled in six months? One month before, a week before, the morning of the appointment, or one day before the appointment? All right, looks like everybody's pretty much saying D. All right, let's see. Yep, one day before the appointment. That's always going to be the right answer. So when you see these questions, I was asking the best time to remind a patient is going to be one day before the appointment. Um, one hint, too, I want to give you all this. When you see questions about, you know, what's the best way to remind a patient is always going to be calling and speaking directly to them, Okay. So you'll see options that'll say like leave a voicemail, um, um, send a text message. The call is always the call a day before is always going to be the best, uh, the best time to remind a patient in the best way. OK. One week before and one month before is too much time to it's too much time because a patient will forget. But um, for the people that chose B, want to put that out there. Morning of appointment is too um, it's too late because they're you know you always want to try to do it the day before. All right, I went back again. Sorry about that. Hold on, guys. I don't know how I did that. What's going on? Okay. Hold on, guys. I don't know how I went back this far. Oh, wow. I didn't realize I went back that far. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm getting old and it's late, so. All right. Here we go. Which of the following should you schedule a patient for when a provider orders a gallbladder removal? Cholestystography. Cholecystogram, cholecystitis, or cholecystectomy? All right, looks like everybody's pretty much saying D. All right, definitely want to be able to recognize certain things, right? So graphy and gram, those are the visual recordings, right? Those are the procedures um, where we are um, taking um, visual exams, right? And then itis. Itis is not even a procedure. Itis is a um, condition, right? Inflammation. Inflammation of, right? So ectomy means surgical removal of. So make sure you all are able to recognize, you know, certain things. You're able to look at certain um, words, okay, and recognize um, that they are either a procedure or condition. And then once you recognize that, okay, that's a con that's a condition. I can rule that out. You know, you want to be able to recognize these things. So that way, when you do see a term that you don't know what it means, but okay, I know what that suffix means. So I know that this is not it, or I know that this gotta be it. All right. Which of the following should be obtained prior to seeing, uh, prior to scheduling a patient with a specialist? A referral, encounter form, EOB, or coordination of benefits? Prior to scheduling a patient with a specialist. All right, looks like everybody's saying A, let's see. That's correct, that's A, referral. And, li and look at this, all three, B, C, and D, that's something that we talked about in previous questions, right? So we can kind of already rule those out. We already know that counterform is used to for the provider to indicate their codes and 
is used for us to, you know, look at and transfer that information to the claim form. We already know that's not it. That's not something that the patient needs before they see a specialist. EOB, we already talked about how that's the ex how that's the form that goes to the patient that details the charges for the visit, right? Coordination of benefits, we already talked about that's that's when we are determining um or indicating which insurance is primary and secondary, right? So the only other answer is referral. One thing I want to mention too, while we're talking about referral, you may see a question that asks, you know, what is something that a patient has to have um, before they have a procedure? I want you all to know that if you see referral and you see order, this answer is going to be the order. So anytime I, I want to kind of touch on that because um, I noticed with some of my students anyway that um, they tend to think that every patient needs a referral. Not every patient needs a referral, but every patient will need an order. So just remember that referrals are only needed by insurance companies that um, that that require it. OK, so not every patient needs a referral for a specialist only if they're like if they have an HMO and their insurance requires it. OK, but not every patient needs a referral, but every patient does need an order. So if you happen to come across that question when it says what is something a patient needs before they have a procedure and you see referral and then you see order, you're like, oh, but I know patients need a referral. No, not every patient, but every patient does need an order. OK. Uh, which of the following describes a procedure to remove unwanted fluid? Thoracentesis, bronchial brushing. Oops, looks like I put bronchial brushing twice. Sorry about that, guys. Or bron uh, bron bron bronchoscopy. Sorry about that. All right, I'm seeing A. So um, as you can see, you are seeing some terminology questions um, for the person who um, asked me earlier, would this help with the CCMA exam as well? You do see that you do see some, you know, um, not clinical questions, but you do see some terminology questions a little on the CMAA. You probably realized by now, I can't remember who that was that asked earlier. All right, let's see. So yes, synthesis. Synthesis is what? Uh, removing fluid, a puncture to remove fluid, okay? That is absolutely correct. So um, there are different variations of, um, um, of, of this question that you'll see, but just know synthesis is one of those terminology questions that you'll, that you'll most, you, you, I don't wanna say you will see, but you have a high likelihood of seeing. Um, because um, I've noticed I've seen it several different ways. So just as long as you know synthesis is removing unwanted fluid, you'll be able to recognize it when you see it. All right. Which filing system protects patient privacy and allows expansion of a high volume office? Numeric, alphabetical, subject filing, or chronological? All right, I'm seeing some mixed answers. I see A, I see D, I see B. Okay, let's talk about this. Okay, patient privacy. So patient it protects patient privacy. We automatically want to rule out alphabetical because that that's um, with alphabetical filing, the patient's names are on the files. So the best way um, to protect patient privacy is going to be you is going to be using a numeric filing system. Okay, so that one we want to rule out right away because it says protect patient privacy. Even though you might wonder, okay, well, why do we use you know alphabetical files if if is if if that doesn't protect patient privacy? Because you know it's not that it that it um 
that it doesn't, but it's not the best way to protect patient privacy, okay? Numeric is always going to be the best way. And then high volume office. First of all, chronological filing is not even a filing system. Chronological is just a method that we use um, when filing information in the patient chart. So that's not even a filing system. So that one we can rule out as well. And then you might say, okay, it's between A and C. Um, the key in this question is that it protects it, it protects patient privacy, yes, and it also allows expansion of a high volume office. So this high volume office that means that there's a lot of patients coming in. Subject filing takes a lot of time. Subject filing is, um, I want to say, is very rarely used because I've never used it, but I don't know. Some places use it. it it's a system, so obviously somebody is using it. But subject filing is when filed, when things are filed according to a, a specific subject. It's just what it says, subject filing. Those are files, um, file, they are filed according to the subject. So like, um, what's an example? Um, it's, it's more so a, a filing system that an office will use um, for things in their office. So like um, materials and things like that, not even really um, a patient chart. So make sure you understand that as well. Um, and then numeric, because we're using numbers instead of their name, that's the best way to protect patient privacy. And then numbers, numbers are unlimited, right? So there is, I don't care how big that office grows, we'll never run out of numbers. So it allows for expansion. Okay. Um, Gustavo says, um, I have both CMA and NHA CCMA, but what are the differences between these two? Does one pay more than the other? That's a really good question, Gustavo. And it's funny you asked it because I'm actually, um, I was actually, before I, um, went live, I was actually working on this next video that I, that I'll be, um, recording. And that's the differences between the CMA, CCMA, uh, CMAA and the RMA. Um, but I'll just quickly tell you here, um, CMA is Certified Medical Assistant. CCMA is Certified Clinical Medical Assistant. Will one pay more than the other? Not necessarily. Um, the, those certifications itself is not going to determine, you know, CMA is going to pay me more than CCMA. No. Um, unless you are applying to a job that specifically says, I want an RMA or I want a CMA. They don't care. As long as you're certified, as long as you have those credentials, whether it's RMA or CMA, most places, they just want you to have the credentials, but they don't care which one. But like I said, unless it specifically says there are some offices who will say, because I've seen it in some job descriptions, there, there are some offices that will say must be CMA, must be RMA, and they may have their reasons. But for the most part, there's not many big differences besides the, you know, of course, the, the test itself and then the organization that offers the test. And that's um, the things that I'll be talking about in that video. So I'm going to be putting that up next week. But hopefully that answers um, your question about the pay. But no, one does not necessarily pay more than the other because it's going to depend on where you work, the specialty, you know, of course, your experience. It's just so many other factors that determines how much you will pay how much you'll make. And then remember the cost of living. So I don't know where you're from, but I'm in DC. So if you're like down South or maybe in the Midwest and you know, where they make a little less, you may make less than what an MA would here in DC. You know, if you're in California, you'll probably make more over there than what the MA would make here, you know? So that makes a difference as well. But I'll talk more about it in that video. You're welcome. Oh, he said the Bay Area and that's California. So, yeah, that's so you'll probably make more over there than what an M and they start over here. And then at the same time, too, it depends on 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 the specialty. It depends on um, the office, you know, so many different things that goes into it, because I don't want to say you'll automatically make more. Um, I just know the cost of living is more over there. But I know with COVID. I've had students leave out of school and make $25 an hour. And that's no lie. Like, because a lot of the offices have been, you know, desperate for people. So they're paying, you know, they're paying some good money. All right. Which of the following describes a provider who has a contract with a third party payer? PPO, 
um, PAR, HMO, or POS? PPO, PAR, HMO, or PA, POS? It's a provider who has a contract with a third-party payer. <laughs> Q said, can I give a hint? <laughs> Q, I would, you know what? I would, but because this is, you know what? I you all should be able to look at this and automatically know the answer. If you're if you're taking the administrative class, you should know this. You can go ahead and give a hint, Q. Go ahead. I'm curious to see what your hand is. Go ahead and give a hint, Q. Um, if you are taking, if you I, if you on the CCMA side, I'll give you a pass. But if you on the administrative side, I need you all to know this. So if, if you don't know this after this, you need to make sure you go look at this material. Okay. Keyword is provider. Good hint. It describes the provider. So let's let's think about this before I reveal the answer. Q just gave a keyword. The keyword is provider. It describes a provider who has a contract with a third party payer. Hey, let's see. I'm seeing a lot of mixed answers. Let's see. All right. Now, why did I say everybody that's taking administrative side should be able to look right at this? Because PPO, HMO, and POS are all um, insurances, okay? Those are all third-party payers. So if you've taken a CMAA, go look at your insurance information again. PPO, HMO, POS, those are all third-party payers. All right. Now, if you don't know what PR, PAR means, let's just say this was the actual test you're taking, right? And you're like, I don't know what PAR means. As long as you know that PPO, HMO, and POS is insurance, you can rule those out and guess PAR and you would have got that right. Okay. This is why it's so important to make sure you know what certain things mean. So now that you know that those are insurance, just make sure you go back and study those insurance so you know the difference between those when you see it on the test, okay? PAR means participating provider. What's a participating provider? That is a provider who's in contract with a third-party payer. PPO, HMO, POS. Any provider that is in contract with any of these insurance, they are considered a participating provider, okay? Or in-network. You might hear in-network, okay? So you said, um, Q, you had this on your actual test. This was, and, and look, Q is telling you this is actually on the test. So you never know, you might see it. All right, which of the following is part of a patient's social history? Maternal grandmother's hypertension, substance use, prior surgeries, or iodine allergy? Social history. Alrighty, I see A, I see mostly B. All right, let's see. All right, you chose B, you're correct. What goes in social history, like substance use, um, alcohol use, um, exercise, how much they exercise, um, depending on where you work, if you work in, um, like GYN, I know the GYN office I used to work in, they even, we, one of our questions we had to ask was how many sexual partners you've had that would go in social history. 
Um, maternal grandmother's hypertension, of course, that's family history. Prior surgeries will be past history or surgical history, right? And an iodine allergy will go in allergies, okay? So another prime example why using process of elimination is very important. Because even if you didn't know, okay, what is social history? At least I do know, okay, mother's grandmother, that's family history. Prior surgery, that is, you know, past history or surgical history. And an allergy is allergies. And then you can kind of rule that out, even if you didn't know what social history was, or if you didn't know where substance use go, okay? So one of the biggest things that I want you all to be taking away from these the exam practices is being able to work through questions, okay? I don't want anybody to look at these as, um, you know, I'm getting the questions. This is what's going to be on the test. I want you to take away knowing how to work through these questions when you see them. When you go take that test tomorrow, for those of you that's going tomorrow, pay attention to keywords again. Make sure you know how to use process of elimination to work through these questions, okay? And again, flag those hard questions and come back to do the easy questions first. Which of the following is an appropriate use of petty cash? Cable subscription, insurance for a company vehicle, office furniture, or postage stamps? Okay, let's see. Let's see, mostly D. All right, let's see. Yep, postage, stamp, postage stamps, so petty cash. So petty cash is not going to be used for bills. So cable subscription, no. Insurance for company vehicle, office furniture. There are budgets for things like that. Petty cash is just for little odds and ends that we might need. For emergency, so the post is saying, so we need to send something off. Let's say we run out of paper and somebody needs to run up the street to the office max, right? Office Depot, Staples, stuff like that, like little miscellaneous stuff. And petty cash doesn't have a lot of money in it. I know the petty cash in the office I worked in, we just kept $100. So it's not a lot of money. So it's not going to be for bills, phone bills, and cable subscriptions, and um, equipment, nothing like that, Okay. All right, who is financially responsible for payment? The beneficiary, adjudicator, fiscal agent, or the guarantor? Oh, I thought I got this one. That's not. Okay, let's see. I'm saying mostly, okay, saying mostly D, okay. Saying mostly D, okay. All right, let's see. Okay, guarantor, that is the person responsible for payment. And the guarantor may or may not necessarily be the patient, okay? So like for an example, I'm my daughter's guarantor because I'm the one financially responsible for payment. So guarantor is a person responsible um, beneficiary is like the people you add, maybe your children, your spouse. Those are your beneficiaries. Those are people that you cover, right? Um, adjudicator, um, those are people who may, um, let's say you have like, like those are people that decide like certain things for your case. I say you have a claim open. Um, fiscal agent, I cannot remember what the, um, I'm drawing a blanket, a fiscal agent. I know that has something to do with the, um, 
the health um insurance as well. I believe they they aid in the claims process. I gotta re I gotta review that myself. I can't remember exactly what that was, but the adjudicator definitely is um the person who hears out um the cases and then fiscal agent. Um if somebody somebody remind me of that really quickly, somebody can look that up for me really quickly. I'm drawing a blank here. I haven't seen that one in a while. Um, she said this was on my exam as well, but they worded it differently. Prime example. Yep, they're worded differently. All right. Which of the following is a priority action when making a financial policy change? Determine the payment arrangements, obtain the patient statement for services delivered, notify all patients of the fee schedule policy change, or revise the fees. Okay. Um, okay. She said no C. Okay. Seeing D and C. All right. What are we going to do? Somebody said A. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what the answer is. So the answer is going to be C. Okay. So priority action this is one of those um, um, keyword questions. Priority action. What's the first thing we want to make sure we do? We want to make sure we notify patients. Okay. So determine payment arrangements, we jump in ahead. Some patients may end up needing payment arrangements, but that has nothing to do with the policy change just yet, right? Um, obtain the patient statement for services delivered. No, revise the fees. Um, the first thing we want to do is notify all the patients of the fee schedule policy change, okay? Um, which of the following items should be sent by certified mail? Laboratory specimen, dismissal letter, billing statement, or prescription medication. Okay, I just had to remember, I had to look into that fiscal agent. Um, but yeah, they they um take care of the claims. I thought so. They take care of the claims. Fiscal agents are the ones taking care of the claims. All right, everybody's pretty much saying B, dismissal letter. Let's see. Yep, that's it. So certified mail. Why do we need to send that certified mail? Because guess what? If we send a certified mail, we get a return receipt. Patient has to sign for it. They can't say that they never received a letter because remember, I think we talked about on one of the videos that um, I think that was the very first video that I've ever done. Um, exam practice video. I was explaining to you all that patients can sue a provider if they don't send them a dismissal letter. They have to let them go the right way. And it's one thing if a, if a doctor has to dismiss a patient, you know, because the patient was irate or, you know, a danger or something like that. But if they are just letting a patient go, they have to go through a process. They have to send that letter. So to make sure that that patient can't sue that doctor for abandonment, we got to send a certified mail. Laboratory specimen, that's sent through a, um, a courier. Billing statement, that's, you know, and prescription medication would be regular mail. Uh, and we're not sending medicine anyway. Um, not us. We wouldn't send the medicine anyway. If any, we can send a prescription to the patient, but we're not sending medication. Um, oh, that was it. I thought we had more. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm sorry. This is it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, make sure if this was helpful to you, make sure you exit the chat and like the video for me. It helps it, you know, get out there so more people can find it and go through these videos and hopefully pass their tests. So go ahead and like this video for me. If you haven't already subscribed, Go ahead and subscribe um, and share with any of your classmates or your colleagues that may benefit from this. 
Um, let me see. Let me know if you guys have any other questions before I end this. I'll wait just a moment. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm sorry, guys. I'm tired tonight. I, I'm. Um, I don't know if you notice. I'm not my. I'm not the same tonight. I'm very tired today. So, um, I hope that I was able to help you all. For those of you that's taking your test tomorrow, let me know. Keep me posted. Come comment on the video tomorrow. Let me know how you did. I wish you all the best. I hope you pass. Just remember flag those hard questions. Don't spend a lot of time on them. Go through all the easy questions first and then go back to the hard questions. Use that process of elimination, okay? Um, you know um, you know those weak areas. Like I said, make sure tonight, for those of you that are testing tomorrow, go over those weak areas. I forgot who it was that said she struggles with anatomy. Go over anatomy tonight. Oh, Samantha says she wished she found these videos early. Oh, welcome, Samantha. She said she had test tummy. Well, you oh, you're taking it. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, Samantha, which test? Let me know which test you're taking. Oh, Cassandra, I see you here. You caught up. Do you need me to share my screen so I can show you how to turn your notifications on? I know you were having problems earlier. Um, let's see. I just want to see if you all have any questions before I end this. Any questions? Make sure you um make sure y'all subscribe. I got a lot of stuff coming on. Shalandra, if you're still working, make sure you email me so we can set something up. Um. Oh, she's taking the CMA. Oh, perfect, perfect. You taking it tomorrow? Okay. Go. I got two other videos besides this one. This is part three. I got two other videos, so you can check those out. Um, Quizlet, of course, is helpful as well. She says she took EKG today. Do you know how you did? You didn't get your results yet? You're welcome, Q, and congratulations again for passing your test. I see you you already took your test and you still join, and I love it. I love to see you all come back even when you pass. Q, are you working in the office? I know you just took your test. Um, did you just finish school? Are you working in the office on an externship? Oh, Samantha says she should know tomorrow she took. Okay, well, I hope you pass the EKG and I wish you the best on your test tomorrow. I'm just going to wait a couple more moments before I end this just to make sure nothing else pops up. Oh, thank you for asking that question, Cameron. This is a um, good question. She said, will I be making a practice for? So um, my classes are about to start back up. Um, the reason why I've had so much time lately is because um, the semester, my summer semester is just about to start back up. So I won't have as much time. I don't know when I'll do a part four. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't, if I get time next week, I may do one next week or maybe not for another couple of weeks, but um, that's why I wanted to make sure I got in at least two this week. I did record a couple videos this week that's going to post next that's going to um post next week and the week after because I know I won't have much time like I have had in the past couple weeks so I'm not sure Cameron thanks for asking though I have no idea um because once my classes start back up I'm going to be busy with that um and then just to let you all know aside from teaching I am an author I've written four books I'm a publisher as well so I publish other authors I'm also in real estate. I'm also a mother. I have a 16-year-old daughter. So I have a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. Um, you're welcome, Latoya. She says, thanks for this refresher. Samantha says, I definitely watch my videos. Perfect, Samantha. Perfect. Okay, Q says she just finished the class. She has a job interview soon. Okay, perfectly. Perfect. I hope it works out for you, Q, for medical office. Okay, got you. Got you. If you're ever willing to come on the channel, um, let me know. I want to do some interviews with some people that's fresh out of school, people that's been working for a while, um, people that's transitioned from medical assistant to nursing. I just want to start doing some other things on this channel. You're welcome, Cameron. You're welcome. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this. Um, let me stop sharing my screen here.
Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this. Hey, Veronica, you're late. We just getting old. Veronica is so late. She just getting on here. Um, I'm about to end this. You all have a good night. I know I said that several times already. You all have a good night. I know the chat stays up for a few moments. Um, let me just go in here because um Cassandra, she is kind of behind, but I told her I would um oh you started your externship this week. Let me share, let me do something really quickly before I end this. Oh, you were watching me say, Oh, got you. Okay. Um, let me do something really quickly for Cassandra because I was telling her earlier that I would help her um that I would help her um turn her notifications on. Hold on. Let me go to this as an example. All right. So let me share my screen really quick. Cassandra, this is for you. All right, Cassandra. So you wanted to know how you... So let's talk about the old versus new way to launch your online course. Oh, so the first thing I want you to know is... You wanted to know how to turn on notifications. So let me share this really quickly. I'm using this as an example. So um, Cassandra, when you're on the page, if you wanna turn on notifications, where you see subscribe, like this is a channel that I'm subscribed to. It's a special needs channel. It's a um, channel where they he interviews special needs kids and things like that. It's a very good channel. But anyway, um, you want to, where it says subscribe and that bell there, you want to click that bell and then you want to make sure it says all so that way you're receiving your notifications. So hopefully this helps. So you just click on the bell and click on all. So hopefully that helped. All right, guys. Okay, Veronica says she want to write exams. I want to write in my exams first week of July. I need all the help there is. You're welcome. You're, you're so welcome, Veronica. All right, ladies and gents, thanks for hanging in there with me. You all have a great night.